This book, which is the nearest exit, may be behind you. The piece is called The Nearest Exit May Be Behind You. <laughs> Thank you for those of you who are giggling. I, really, I didn't really deserve that laugh, but I appreciate that you were willing to give it to me anyway. So there I am in my seat on one of those small commuter flights from uh, somewhere to home. At this point, the travel details are lost to memory. What's still clear is it was the last leg of a flight after a long tour, and I was tired and somewhat wrung out from several universities worth of question and answer and explaining myself and my life over and over again. All I wanted was a little room and a little quiet. Now, neither one of these is really possible at my personal size and shape on a uh, Dash 8, if you've got a seat mate. A Dash 8 is one of those planes that has two by two seating up and down the side. I was seated toward the rear, having chosen to sit in row 18, seat C. 18 is a lucky number in Hebrew. Uh, since Hebrew numbers are also letters, the letters spell out the word chai, or life. And I am a slightly nervous flyer. The Dash 8 has 23 rows, so I was sitting most of the way back in my seat and hoping to be left alone in it. I performed all of my usual magic to keep the seat next to me free. I hadn't buckled my seatbelt, hadn't moved any of my spare items over, and I hoped, as I do, that if I behaved as though I might gain a seatmate at any moment, then the sprites of air travel would be kind to me and allow me to fly the last hour and a half from, you know, possibly Philadelphia to home in relative comfort. This often works. I was full of optimism. And then I saw her. Coming up the aisle in a pastel twin set. Do you have those here? Is it those? Okay, just check. It's one of those things, right? Every once in a while, but it doesn't translate. Those sweatery markers of women of a certain class, yet some sort of a frosted bangs situation on her head. You know exactly who I mean, don't you? Little, little tiny gold cross just winking in the airline fluorescent light. And from hours and years of long experience, I knew somehow that she was holding the ticket for seat. 18A. I watched her make her slow progress up the aisle, holding her bulging tote bag and wearing an expression of general superiority, scanning ahead to see who her seatmate might be, as we do. Her eye fell on me, and her lips tightened, and her eyes narrowed. Now, I thought that I was seeing the single woman's customary response to the news, and she's sitting next to kind of a big dude. I confess that I sometimes actually like to see this. I have very good non-encroachment skills for these kinds of situations, and so I was imagining to myself how pleased she would be to discover that I can and would fly the whole way with my arms folded to reduce shoulder span, and with my hips shifted so I could lean slightly away from her and into the aisle. I wasn't at all pleased to be gaining a seatmate, but I figured at least she and I could coexist quietly in the small space, and maybe the next time she was consigned to sit next to a big fella, she wouldn't make such a terrible face. As I said, I'm an optimist. I made as if to get up so she could settle into her seat without having to clamber over me. Just one more service we provide here at House of Fatboy. <laughs> when I 
I realized that she wasn't slowing down at all. She continued right past me into the galley to where the flight attendant was waiting for us all to sit down and shut up so that she could do her pre-flight things. I assumed that she was going so that she could take a long view of the cabin to see whether there was a seat next to someone who <laughs> maybe a little smaller or maybe a free pair of seats. I wasn't offended. I have done the same myself and in fact, I was a little relieved at the thought that maybe I would get a reprieve after all. But when she got to the back, she addressed the flight attendant instead. I can't sit there, she announced. What other seat may I use? I barely had time to admire her correct use of the word may when the <laughs> flight attendant asked the next reasonable question. What's the matter with that seat? I can't sit there, she replied. Anywhere else is fine. The flight attendant replied somewhat impatiently, ma'am, I can't help you unless you tell me what the problem is. <laughs> I won't sit there. I don't want to put myself at risk of catching anything. The flight attendant looked puzzled. Catching anything? My frosted former seatmate hissed, the gay. I don't want to catch it. <laughs> my eyebrows flew up into my hairline. I turned around to look at the flight attendant who was wearing an expression that I'm fairly sure matched mine. We were both dumbfounded. <laughs> now, airlines have policies about such things. They will not reseat you just because you don't happen to like the look of your seatmate. Or perhaps I will, should say, historically, they will not. Although, now that flying while Muslim or merely appearing to be Muslim or perhaps just bearded has become such an issue, sometimes they flout that rule. But there are rules to prevent this kind of general duty bigotry from being acted out. And the flight attendant clearly <laughs> knew that. She looked over Miss Sweaterset's shoulder at me and sort of waved her hands questioningly. I could tell that she was leaving the choice up to me. Either for reasons of personal preference or to protect herself from a violation of airline policy, I really couldn't say, but regardless, she was clearly bouncing this particular homophobic ball back into my court. I considered my options. On the one hand, I had the opportunity to more or less trap Miss Sweater Set between me and the wall of the airplane <laughs> for the better part of 90 minutes. <laughs> I could read gay books. I could write gay smut on my laptop in a really large font. I could discourse helpfully about the life of the modern homosexual, perhaps giving a little speech about gays throughout history little speculation, perhaps, about the preferences of Eleanor Roosevelt, or a discussion of the water jug carrying man, a highly gender non-normative behavior for the time, who leads Jesus to the Last Supper, as referenced in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, for when you get home. <laughs> I could read to her about from the collected speeches of Harvey Milk, or Maybe I could just take the opportunity to cough on her a lot. <laughs> Complete with much apologetic touching. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? <clears throat> over and over <laughs> Listen, I'm not a saint. It would have been a lot of fun. <laughs> Then I realized that if I relinquished this particular set of dubious pleasures, I could have my seat to myself again, that the probably sympathetic flight attendant was not going to make someone else move to accommodate the 
wishes of what's her name, I could spread out my things and my body. I could probably work or sleep. <laughs> In that moment, if I'm being honest, I have to say I had no compassion whatsoever for Miss Sweater Set. I like to imagine that I can act with generosity even toward people who avow themselves my enemies, and sometimes I really can, and this was not that day. I was tired, I didn't care about her. I was thinking about myself and how tired I was, and how I was not equipped for any more bullshit or nonsense, and so I waved her off. The flight attendant reseated her, immediately in front of a screaming infant with an inattentive parent, I was pleased to note, and I buckled my seatbelt and raised my armrest and put my arms down. Just after that, the usual safety demonstration was given. I generally tune it out because I hear it about twice a week on average. There are really only so many times that one needs to be admonished to put on one's own oxygen mask before assisting <laughs> one's companion, before that has really set in. And likewise, I'm pretty sure that if you woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning and asked me where my nearest exit might be, I would say, it might be behind me. <laughs> before I threw something at you, I went back to sleep. I know all the words to that speech by heart. But somehow that day, after Miss Sweater Set's Catch the Gay hijinks and my torrent of reaction to it, when the flight attendant said, please take a moment to locate your nearest emergency exit. Remember, the nearest usable exit may be behind you. I heard it in a whole new way. Though it took a little while for me to figure out exactly what had sent the shiver up my spine. I considered it as I sat there. The flight was otherwise uneventful. The flight attendant tried to apologize to me, and I told her very firmly that it wasn't in any way her fault, and then I had a little nap in comfort. Of course, immediately after my plane landed, I called everyone I knew to report to them what had happened. And they were all suitably, satisfyingly both horrified and amused. People asked me what I was wearing, what I was reading, if I'd spoken to her, made some sort of eye contact, all of them dancing around the same question, how did she peg you as a queer? And uh, not only that, but what kind of a queer did she think you were? <laughs> I have no idea, really. I wasn't wearing an expressly gay t-shirt. All of my uh, books and magazines were still stowed in the overhead compartment. I don't know if she thought I was a dyke or a fag or a transsexual or what. Well, I don't know what signifiers she was responding to, which in retrospect would have been the right reason to ask to have her seated next to me. I don't know if it was my hair, my glasses, or my clothes, or just my general homotastic self, but <laughs> something about me was clearly too queer for her comfort, and it triggered a full-fledged gay panic and splattered all over me. It's the nature of gay panic to do that, even though the whole phenomenon is more or less entirely about the person experiencing it. And their fears about homos. What if it talks to me? <laughs> what if I like it? <laughs> what if I, you know, like it? <laughs> Gay panic is almost never contained where it belongs. Being visible in the world as a queer person is one of those things that comes with a whole set of free gift with purchase experiences, and you never really know exactly what you're getting to, or how it's going to act. And in fact, this whole book consists of stories and essays written and told because being so identified on a plane made me think in a whole new way about what it means to be visibly different. 
visibly queer in the new and the old sense of the word. Sometimes it's lovely. Sometimes it means recognizing your people or knowing where to turn when you need shelter of some kind. But it also breeds a certain watchfulness, at least in me. Once I finish chewing on the phrase, I realize I almost always know where the nearest exit is, metaphorical or actual, especially when I'm with new people or in a new place, and I feel nervous if I don't. So thank you, Miss Sweater Set. Wherever you are, thank you for sparking an entire volume of stories about how being readable as queer, as transgressive, informs and shapes life. However delighted you might not be to have contributed to more than 200 pages of queer and trans storytelling, I am nonetheless very grateful. Thank you.